Today, we're going to talk about something that one of you requested, and that is um, self-sabotage. All about self-sabotage or how to prevent self-sabotage, things along those lines. You know, it's, a, it's actually a really good topic because it's something that I think people underestimate. You know, we don't realize. We, we, we get caught up in talking a lot of times about what people have done to us or healing what has happened in our lives. We don't as often talk about our own self-abuses. And there's all kinds. I mean, we can talk about self-abuse, meaning, you know, how was, it, how was it ever a good idea to date some of the people we've dated? You know, think about it who you've dated and, and how some of them were not a good idea, then that's self-sabotage. You, you might have even had a relationship or a marriage and you said, you know, that was a, a not so good of a thing and I really got to change my life. And then you went out and still did things and dated people that were not in your best interest. They were not congruent with your higher good. How was that a good idea? And is that their fault? You know, here we are again, it's self-sabotage. Um, we have a, a very hidden dislike for ourselves, unbeknownst to most people. And most people that would say, well, I don't, I don't have such a thing. Um, and I, you know, I'm not asking you to overly beat up on yourselves, of course. But it's almost better to just be honest and say it's a possibility that there are some things of myself that I don't like than it is to try to be all oh, I love myself and, you know, I have little cards in my mirrors. I love myself and I, all, I speak about how much I love and appreciate every part of my body. You know, those are neat things and your life coaches help you with that and um, counselors will help you because it's good to have self-love, self-worth and self-love, but not at the expense of pretending that some of the other things aren't there. Other things like, you know, I do all the self-love stuff, but what good does it do me if I go to my counselor, they're teaching me this, encouraging me to make affirmations of self-love and then, you know, date someone that that's just, oh, well, I was lonely or, oh, well, I was thinking that would be wonderful for intimacy or whatever else, you know. Um, the counselor shouldn't just let that go. They should call you on it. And I know many do, but they should call you on it to the point where, where maybe if you do it too often, they should say, I don't think I'm your best counselor because my goal, and you're hiring me by the way, to keep this from happening. And that is my goal, but it's not stopping. You're still sabotaging your life. And I really don't want to be part of that. I'm not saying they should do that to be rude. They're saying it as sort of a tough love to say, you might want to look at this and get a different counselor who will help you, maybe one that's more firm or stronger about um, taking you in that direction. But it does take a lot. It, it takes a lot for us to look at when you know something's going wrong. We try to ignore it. We try to minimize things that don't feel quite right. And all of that is self-sabotage. You know, um, and I, I think it's one of the worst acts that we can commit because self-sabotage means that no matter, even if I have people in my life that are nice and trying to, you know, move me along in the right direction as friends or partners or employees or employers or whatever they are, self-sabotage means that we're going to find a way to behind the scenes, behind the curtains, um, mess things up somehow. Now, sometimes it's very obvious. So there's really two types of, uh, two ways we apply self-sabotage, obvious and not so obvious. And the obvious, you know, fair enough. I mean, it's obvious. So you, we should be able to see that and you should be able to call yourself on it. Really, the not so obvious, those are the ones that are hard because the reason they're not obvious is not because we're incapable of seeing them. They're not obvious because we actually smoke screen them. Those are the ones we don't want to admit that we're doing or participating in. Those are the ones we want to whitewash and just, you know, gee, I'm just a victim or I don't know how this happened or whatever. But when we do a lot of self-inventory, we're going to realize I, how I might have played a part in this. You know, when you look at doing 12-step work, you know, there are some steps involved with a, a really a, encouraging us to look at how we might have played a role. How, how was I self-serving in this situation? Now, of course, most people do not want to believe they're ever self-serving, especially when we're just such innocent victims. But when you really apply your imagination, if you try to apply your, your head, your ego is going to try to protect you. 
When you apply your imagination, higher mind, by the way, your imagination, when you apply your imagination and you say, I can't see logically how I might have played a part in sabotaging this. I would have never, ever wanted a partner that was going to um, be um, engaging in addictions, let's say, behind my back, you know, a gambling or something like that. I would have never wanted to do this. So that could not involve me. You got to stop and go, okay, but if I were, if I were imagining, if I were in any way a part of this, what might it have been? The head's going to say nothing. It had nothing to do. I didn't even know about it. It was them. We heard that already. Now try another game. Let's play imagination. How might you have been a part of that? And you kind of go, well, okay, let's see. If I had a partner and they were engaging in addictions and I didn't know, like gambling or whatever, and I didn't know, how might that have been self-serving? Um, well, which part? Them doing it or my not knowing? Let's start with your not knowing. How might your not knowing been self-serving? Because psychically you did know. You did. On some unconscious level, you probably had dreams that were trying to tell you and you don't remember your dreams. Why did you self-sabotage? Why did you do it? And you might say, because if I would have known, I would have been called to do something about it. And I'm too scared. Very good. That hurts, man. Cry. You can be mad about it, sad about it. Get that emotion out. Just go ahead and be honest about it. But at least now we know why you did it. And there's less likelihood that you'll do it again if you apply this, this recognition uh, kind of a technique. So, you know, it's, there's a point where we have to say, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves and, you know, just um, a willingness to say, I'm not, I'm just no longer willing to let stuff slip by or sneak by. And you know what? There's another word for that. It's called being conscious in your life. Being a conscious participant. It's kind of cool if you think about it. Well, then what was I before? Well, it's very simple. You were unconscious in more ways than one. Um, unconscious meaning unknowing, but unconscious meaning spiritually it's called being asleep or unconscious you know it's like being in a a trance um, and the trance is not always imposed by other people self-induced trances it's you know we, we allow um, our hurts and angers um, to remain greater than our desire to heal think about it this is why a course in miracles says you have to know your pain tolerance he says you really have to learn this concept pain tolerance meaning at some point, everybody gets fed up with whatever's happening, including self-sabotage. So when your desire to heal is greater than your desire to hide, then you'll be willing to look at self-sabotage. However, when your desire to hide is greater than your desire to heal, you'll probably still be engaging in self-sabotage. And by the way, again, self-sabotage is not just I mean, that's where we take our stuff out on ourselves. Why? Okay, various reasons. I'm angry at myself. I'm, I'm sad. I'm fed up. All these things will start making me take stuff out of myself. In other words, it's like self-sabotage is like where we have played judge and jury on ourselves and are punishing ourselves. And, you know, that makes a very obvious sad kind of a scenario. But that's when, it's, or when, when we're aware of it. Remember, ha more, more often than not, we're not even aware that it's happening. So our attempt to judge and jury ourselves is even worse because we're not just judge and jury, which is like, gosh, I'm kind of hard on myself, like perfectionisms and being hard on ourselves. Man, that beats us up. That's very hard, very heavy handedness on ourselves. But I'm saying that the covert stuff is even worse because the covert stuff means things like, um, I, I know people... Um, you know, who, who sabotage their finances. It, I mean, probably all of us at one time or another. And here's what I mean. I don't just mean I'm not earning enough money. I'm talking about, look at the times when, when we say, I'm going to start practicing prosperity. I'm going to look at where I can cut back on um, a couple bills. So you go out there and you, you find you can, you can save a hundred bucks a month on a bill. Let's just say that, for example. Great. Now you will have $100 more a month, right? It should be. That's the math. Logic, $100 saved, $100 earned. That's now going to be in your savings, right? Oh, no, no. Because it'll just happen to you know, be that 
um, a bird flies into your window of your house and your house is $100 that month. Next month, you need your tires rotate $100. Next month, you need oil chase $100. It's, it's like somehow the money's going to find another outlet. Now, the good news is at least you had the money to take care of those things. But I'm saying that people, when they find that they have more of something that should be good, it ends up disappearing. So be willing to ask yourself, does that happen to you? You know, and, and money is a good one to use for that, that example. It's a real, it, trust me, just it's, it's one of the better, simpler ones to, to practice that with. When I seem to be able to create something good, why does it somehow disappear, whatever that thing is? And I think it's easier to look at it on a financial level than on a dating level because it's a little more objective because it's just numbers. Um, but think about that, you know, in, in any way that, that works. Um, there's also uh, sabotage when it comes to healing. Now, you might want to journal around this because you may not remember, you know, all of the circumstances in your life. But there are times when you or I might have gone to, a, say, a chiropractor and you go, wow, you know, maybe, maybe you were afraid, first of all, to go to the chiropractor um, or naturopath or acupuncture, whatever it might have intimidated you or whatever. Let's say you had some sort of apprehension. So now you actually go. But then afterwards, you tell somebody, oh, I went to an acupuncturist today. Oh, who'd you see? I saw, you know, Dr. Joe. And um, they say, oh, I've heard bad things about them. See, because you already had apprehension, now you're looking for evidence to confirm your doubts about going or that doctor or whatever it was you're trying to sabotage. So you ha have created evidence to substantiate your own issue. And that's, you know, that's not only sad because that person might have been good for you, but even if you're just using them, this story, that corroborating story from your friend, you, you know, to support judgments, that's not even a good thing to be doing anyway. So there's other examples of that, but you know, you go to a healer. I've had this happen with people. They come to me and they've had amazing healings. They're miraculous. They're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is amazing. And then they go to a family member and the family members, wow, you know, you're glowing. What, what, what's happened for you? Oh, I went to this healer. What, what do you mean healer? Yeah, this guy, they, a lot of people say he's a, a spiritual healer and he did some counseling with me and some energy work and oh my God, I felt instantly healed. And then, I mean, this has happened a lot. Family members go, oh, now wait a minute. That's not our religion. That's of the devil. Um, or, um, oh, that stuff, that's all bogus. I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a doctor. I know better than that. I can tell you it's all bogus. None of that's real. They plant seeds of doubt. The client then later tells me I was doing so well and then this, these people filled my head with garbage and then it started shifting. My old patterns started coming back. That's right. Self-sabotage. Well, is it self-sabotage when the other people are the ones that plant that stuff? Um, you know, they're contributing, but it's still self-sabotage because you listen to them. Remember that when someone downloads negative stuff like gossip or whatever to us, first of all, we have to choose and we have to take responsibility. Are we going to listen to it or not? Secondly, are we going to believe it once we heard it? That's a choice. Then third, are we going to take that we believed it and pass it on and make it even worse? So we have, we have choices in the matter and, and um, we have to take responsibility for those choices. So just keep that in mind. But it's still self-sabotage. So think about this if you don't mind. Why is it that sometimes Jesus actually told people that he healed, do not tell anyone about this? Think about this. <laughs> Why did Jesus sometimes say, and do not tell anyone? And I've heard, you know, that brought up rarely, but it's brought up once in a while. A minister, a ra you know, somebody out there, a minister or a um, pastor or something like that, you know, and they'll, they'll theorize. Um, they think it was because of this or that. One of the main reasons is because he's telling them, you've been healed. Now, if you go and tell other people about it, they're going to try and talk you out of your experience, your goodness. Um, and if they do, heaven help both of you. The person, by the way, who talks you out of your, um, your healing experience, 
you know, those are the kinds of things where Jesus says, man, people like that are better off tying a rope around their necks and the other end of the rope to a rock and throwing themselves off a bridge. He's not trying to be harsh as much as it sounds. He's saying the guilt, the karma of someone screwing up someone else's achievement, someone else is getting closer to God, like through healing, and um, someone goes and, and destroys it with some garbage. And I've heard garbage about everybody. Oh my God. You can look it up on the internet. I'm sure, you know, I wouldn't bother. I, I just don't even feed this kind of stuff if you can avoid it. But if you insist on sabotaging yourself and looking up for looking up garbage on the internet to feed your head with more garbage, that's self-sabotage. But if you insist on doing that, you could. But, um, you know, you could look up the Pope, Buddha. I mean, there's every one of them has a... a um, one of those extra pages that say this person's of the devil or they're, you know, whatever. Um, I've heard people diss me, um, but that's an example where still somebody um, on the internet, they'll say, oh, did you hear? I heard, I heard, you know, it's always, I heard from a friend of a friend of a friend that such and such happened. And, and it's weird because there's other people that'll read those and go, oh, you're kidding. I should have known. I bet now they'll pass it on. That is evil. And I don't even have another word I'm going to use for it. It's evil. It's evil incarnate. It's evil manifested. It's evil in, in words. It's evil because it's hatred and you're not being responsible for your hatred. So you are creating sabotage. And underneath that one little act of evil, it connects to all the other evils where the ego of this world, the, the archetype ego slash evil of this world, the bottom line is it has a goal and it is this. It wants you to feel hopeless. It wants you to have no hope in anything. Find fault in everyone so that you don't have hope in anyone, so that you are hopeless, which means you are the living dead. That's what it's trying to do. Have hope in nobody. And that's why one of the best ways to prevent self-sabotage is this. Watch for that, that tendency to look for fault so that you have nothing left to believe in. It's really not easy, man. It's really not easy to catch ourselves all the time, but it can be done. Um, watch for it. And you'll see, you'll see people in your life that are trying to find fault with you so that they don't have hope in you. Like, let's say you're a, a speech therapist. Let's say you're a physical therapist. Let's say whatever you do, um, someone out there is going to wonder. They're, you know, they're going to plant a seed to, to friends of yours. They can't be that good. They can't, oh, physical therapist. Oh, you know what happened? I had an uncle that went to a physical therapist once and they hurt him. You know, somebody's always got a story. Forgetting the other 99 stories in comparison or 999 stories to the positive. The positives are not always passed around. But one negative, man. Negatives, they say, enter the mind and they stick like it's Velcro. Positive thoughts and experiences, according to the brain's um, um, response, the brain responds to positive experiences like Teflon. They come in and slip through like they're nothing. It's really strange. But yet negatives stick. And we all know that because, you know, you might have had, you know, several positive experiences and they don't seem to have quite the impact of a really harsh negative one. Um, that's just, that's the way the brain is wired, but not by God. It's the way it's wired by our ego. And as we heal, we replace the old wiring with new ways, with, with new styles that come from God, which are positive start to be treated as Velcro and stick. They become all we're interested in. Negatives become Teflon and just slip on through. Um, you know, when I was saying like, um, you know, ways of, of dealing with, one of the best things to do is, you know, to prevent self-sabotage is instead of going, uh oh, there's that one negative story about that person, so they're bad. Try this instead. First of all, grow up spiritually and try something else instead of going with the, the masses. You know, don't be a sheep and just follow along. Don't be a lemming and just jump off the cliff with everybody. Stop and say, wait a minute. Technically, we all could find disagreements of some kind or another with each other. I mean, I could tell you, I don't agree with everything Jesus did in history, you know, in his life in history. I, I, gee, I might've suggested this or that based on what we hear he said. I mean, we could do it even with Jesus. We could do it with anyone. 
Any of us could, we could question the way a, an angel brought a message to a person. Ooh, that was a little harsh. Or it was, we could all question each other on anything. So here's what you can do. Allow a certain percentage of acceptable flaws and let them go. Instead of, uh oh, there's a flaw and fanning it into a flame that's you know bigger than the spark that it was, fanning it into a flame and going, oh, that's it, throw them out. Stop it and just say, wait a second. It's kind of cool. You'll, you'll find this to be really effective and helpful in so many ways. Acceptable flaws, acceptable issues. You know, so it's like, um, I love a certain actor. They did 10 movies. One of them it did, I didn't like. I Acceptable. That's the acceptable percentage. A band has an album. They have 15 songs on the album. One or two I didn't like. That's an acceptable percentage percentage of difference. See, just let it be. But if I start finding that a partner or a favorite band or a favorite actor or whatever, you know, everybody's into, um, a favorite author, whatever it happens to be, if I start finding that half of your behaviors as my partner, half of the books you write um, are not quite, you know, I don't quite get it or get into them, I, that's no longer that that percentage that's kind of acceptable. Now, and I'm not saying we have to be mean or judge, I'm saying now I could say, no, you know, that author doesn't work for me so much because it's, uh, you know, a large percentage. Um, I think that we all could look at where that we crossed the line, but, but gosh, you know, allow 10%, allow 20%. You might allow 30%, but at that point, I think it starts to really shift from acceptable percentage. It's kind of like the same as me saying on a zero to 10 scale, when something drops below a seven, you know, a 10, a nine, an eight, a seven, when it starts hitting there, um, be concerned when your relationship or job or whatever hits a six, a five, and further down the scale. It's kind of like that. For me, if something's, you know, um, is something's off 10 or 20%, that's about it for me. Not that I'm gonna throw somebody out when they're 25%. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna start changing something, and this is more advice, to deal with self-sabotage. Instead of watching for a flaw, fanning it into a flame, and ruining that that was a good friend or a partner or a job, and you didn't need to toss it out, it was only 10 or 20 percent of a problem. You sabotaged yourself today by being a bit rash or reactive. Um, try this. Try working on the issue. It's dropping down the scale or the percentage of, you know, acceptable is getting higher. Stop and change what you can before you accept what you can't change, which means I'll accept that this is kind of going south. It's not working for me and that's okay. But have you done anything to change it? You might be sabotaging something in your life if you've not made any attempt to fix it and instead just let it die. You, you, you know, we all have to kind of beware of that. Um, if you're gonna deal with um, Self-sabotage, I would recommend to look at your fears of the unknown. If you're in a situation in your life, always take time to stop and say, is there anything about this that could be a fear of the unknown? Such as when you're starting to, you know, well, I was thinking of going to a workshop. Michael's doing a workshop. I'm thinking of going to a workshop. Oh, wait. Um, oh, the flights went up last night. They're 20 more dollars. Oh, I don't think I'll go. I guess it isn't meant to be. That's just, that's just lame. It has nothing to do with meant to be. You're trying to sabotage. You're going to a workshop to get some changes in your life. So at least ask yourself, but what am I afraid of? Is it I'm afraid of the unknown because I've never gone to a workshop? Is it fear of, oh, this is a healing workshop and I'm probably going to have to look at stuff? It's understandable to be afraid. Do I want that to control my life? If I do, just own it. No problem. But it's called self-sabotage. And just pin it up somewhere, just like you do the, I am wonderful and uh, I'm happy and go lucky. You know, you pin those up, go ahead and pin up, and I tend to self-sabotage. I mean, don't hide from it, at least own that you did it. And then take some time, because self-healing is a part of dealing with self-sabotage. If you're on the path of self-healing, you're going to exponentially, you're going to immediately take a chunk out of self-sabotage. Because when you're in your 12-step work or you're in your self-healing work, that's requiring that you look at yourself. And that tends to, you know, keep you from kind of steering off too far into la-la land. So 
you know, just be thinking in terms of, um, are there fears of the unknown? Um, is it, I don't want to heal, do, you know, am I afraid of having to heal old patterns? Because I would recommend get on the healing path, stay on the healing path, make it a part of your life and lifestyle. Um, I don't mean just, you know, what you eat. I'm talking about your maintenance program, your psychological maintenance program. So, you know, do consider that. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing. I'll just share a couple of quick stories or examples. But um, in my own life, when, when I've seen friends, let's say, because um, it, it happens with everybody, every relationship, even a relationship with your car or your animal, all relationships tend to go through three stages. Remember, one stage is the honeymoon stage where everything seems peachy. Um, other than for people you just immediately don't like, uh, they just go right to stage two. But stage one is like a honeymoon stage. Stage two is you're starting to find fault, okay? And that's where usually we fall apart. But for the brave of heart, man, there's a stage called stage three waiting for us if we're willing to take responsibility, look at our part, heal our stuff, and shift into a state of forgiveness with that person so that we enter stage three. doesn't mean we have to move in with them or, or hang out with them. Just that there's a, I get what I was doing. I was finding fault. I'm willing to say sorry in my mind towards that person and to myself, release that and wish them well spiritually. Um, then I've countered that tendency towards self-sabotage. But, you know, in, in my life, um, when I've seen friends, uh, you know, it's like this. It's like Jesus, when he saw Judas was doing the game, he saw Judas was starting to, hmm, you know, this Jesus thing might not work out, you know, but I think if we can kind of push him in front of the, the Sanhedrin, he can argue his case. And if he can convince them that he's wonderful, heck, we're all going to be living high on the hog, man, because we'll start becoming a nation and, 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 and kick Rome out of our town and land, land and so on. Um, so Judas starts getting in his head into that going into that trip, self-sabotage. And, um, you know, but he's pretending like everything's just peachy, just like you and I. We have friends and they, they start judging, they start gossiping about us, and they just want to act like everything's peachy. Well, if you're sensitive, you start catching on. And I'm sensitive enough to know these things typically. I don't want to always know all of it, um, but I, I pick up typically um, those things. And Jesus picked it up. Well, how did he handle it? Do you know what he told Judas? Go do it. Get it over with. You're going to do it anyway. So just go do it. That's what he says. Go read your Bible, man. He says, you know, that thing you're going to do, go do it. Get it done quickly. Like, come on, dude. Let's not play games is what he's saying. Just get on it. This is where you're going. And, uh, and, and Jesus is saying, in effect, I'm going to use this for my own goals too. Um, how is this self-serving? Um, because I can, I'm going to use this to let myself be taken with no sin or flaw. And you're going to kill me because it's going to free the world, free, you you know, all beings. But without getting into that, um, my point is that when he saw Judas was going to do this, he just said, you know, go ahead, man, just get it over with. He, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like you're, you're going to the edge anyway. Let me just help you, you know, and push you over the edge. Now, most of us um, would rather beg them not to turn on us. We would do anything. We'll bargain with them. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I do something? I'm so sorry. You know, um, let me, let me try to fix this. Jesus said, and I believe it too. I practice it too. Just bring things to the light. If a person's starting to diss you or turn on you or gossip, or, you know, about you, I don't care who their business associates, partner, anybody. Um, you just call it, Hey, what's going on? And, um, there are times I just go, I'm just going to help you. You're going up to the edge anyway. Let me just give you a little nudge, you know. Um, I would rather start it with, let's be honest, let's be loving and try to clear this. But I'm going to tell you, probably four out of five people that are starting to do this to you, I would probably say four or five. Could be three out of five sometimes, but as many as four out of five do not want to come back to sanity. They're determined. And once they're determined, you're only going to hurt you and them to keep trying to beg them to not go through with it. You know, when you see that they're, you know, they're losing it, it's better to just 
resign from that and say, you know, Judas, just go and do what you're going to do. Oh, I, I wasn't going to do that. Or they'll say, oh, I was just a little mad because you were doing this. But if you just make up for you know, that, then I promise I'll be nice again. I would often say, okay, let's try it again. But I'll watch because usually when they're, once they start to lose their mind, man, once the ego has, you know, bit them on the neck, um, they're vampires, you know, and I'm not trying to make them into bad. I'm saying they're doing what they want to do. All I'm suggesting is that you not play into it. Those people are sabotaging something. Now, now let me add a little footnote. If you've been rude or a jerk or mean, you know, in some way, if you've harmed people overtly, especially, um, then them talking about you isn't like they're gossiping or doing something wrong. They're trying to survive with the fact that you you might be overtly hurtful to them if you stole from them or you know did something. I'm not saying that they're doing something wrong by talking about it. They're trying to sort it out. I'm talking about when people, when you're trying to bring something good into people's lives and they're still going to find fault or flaw with you. You know, I try to do it the the nice way. Try to be honest. I suggest you do the same. Try to encourage honesty and communication. Try to encourage, um, um, re- you know, responsibility and let's, can we work this out? But watch, because usually on the face, yes, let's work this out. But behind, there's not any intention or action to that effect. Instead, what they often start to do is just go right back into whatever they were doing. You know, kind of like once bitten, they're, they're, they're done. Um, it's not, you know, it's not easy to, to, to kind of, it takes like kind of a lot of strength and courage because most of us are so weak, we don't want them to turn on us. So we beg, borrow, steal to get them to not do that. And I'm saying you're harming yourself. First of all, you're in denial. Second of all, you're harming yourself because you're bar, you're, you're bargaining to try to keep something intact that isn't intact. Third, you're enabling their strength, their ego's strength because they're trying to turn on you and you're trying to beg them not to, which means they're going, ha, gotcha. You know, I can control you. And and I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying throw them over the cliff. Don't be too rash or whatever. Try communication, try loving and so on. But once, if you're a healer and people, you know, somebody's causing people to doubt you or some client of yours is, is doubting you, you might not keep them keep them on. A good counselor knows when a client starts doing that, they start exhibiting signs of an unhealthy client, almost like a client that's struggling with certain personality disorders and they tend to cut them loose because they realize I'm, I'm screwed here. I'm, I'm going to sink with you if I continue to have you as my client. One day you love me, the next day you hate me. Uh, you know, this is just not a good idea. So um, I, I recommend that we do things like help them snap out of it if you can. You know, just just do something to help bring them out of, of that part of their minds if you can. Tell them you're on to them. Tell you know tactfully. Tell them you're on to them. Tell them, look, it seems like you know you don't even have to let them know how much you're on to them. But you can say it just seems like you've not been happy with me and so on and so on. And you know, oh no, I'm fine. Um, but you have to, you know, you have to carry it a little further sometimes. Um, I, I remember, just to share a personal example though, um, I remember um, an example where um, somebody I was involved with, um, there was somebody I was involved with and somebody else entered our life. They entered peripherally and they kind of came in, wanted to be more involved with, with my life and hang around me or whatever. Um, but when I saw them, I knew, I thought, oh man, this is the person. They're gonna make a move on the person I'm involved with. Now the other person, I tried to warn them, watch out, you know, be, oh no, no, that's silly. That's no, no, no way at all. And I'm like, okay, watch out, you know, and then it continued a little further, a little further. And I'm like, hey, watch out. No, no problem. They were totally in denial. Now they were in denial at first, maybe because they didn't believe it. So that's innocent enough. But after a while, they started responding and getting more involved. So now when they're denying it, they're denying it. You know, and I'm always on tour in those days. So, I mean, it wasn't going to be easy for me to uh, maintain a relationship anyway, because I was always on tour anyway. But um, I saw it and called it and it was denied and denied and denied. And finally, finally, I just said, okay, look, here's what's happened. It, this has already happened. You guys have already gotten involved. You guys have already done this, that, and the other, ABC. And I just called it for what it was. The denials continued for a little while longer than one day. It was admitted. And um, 
that was kind of the beginning of the end, you know, of that relationship for me, the one I was in. Um, and not with hatred and all that. It was still loving and forgiving, you know, trying to hang in there and, and, and work the pieces out because I think it's nice for us to do that. But my point and the moral of this story, the context was that when I saw it, I just called it. Now, here's another um, example of this that might be a little weird or a little um, um, personal. Um, but I remember when I was in my 20s, um, maybe late 20s, early 30s, somewhere in there, I was uh, speaking at a conference. I was already you know, doing that work all, all those years ago. And I was speaking at a conference and I was at a hotel and I had a room there. Um, to spend the night and then speak the next day and all that. That's kind of typical for conference speakers. And there were a few friends of mine that came and stayed, uh, either stayed or showed up the next day when I spoke. In any case, one of them was a little bit scared that another one of my friends was getting more of my time and maybe intimate time with me. And they were getting kind of jealous and hurt and concerned and all that. And I could just tell, but they would say, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I trust you. You know, everybody's fine. But I could just tell this was building. So when this finally happened at this, at this conference, um, this person, um, I had the feeling. I just intuited this is, this is happening. This is going to blow up soon. So um, I made my room where I was staying, I made my room look... <laughs> um, there's things I did to, to, to make the scene um, the crime scene looked like um, I was in fact involved with somebody and, and spent time with them. I won't say the things I did, but I did and um, made it look this way. And um, lo and behold, we're in the conference speaking and the other person um, that was suspicious and afraid said, oh, um, I have to go um, get do some things and get cleaned up. Do you mind if I go to your room? <laughs> so inside I'm like, sure. I knew where it was going. They went to the room when they were gone, just so I had, you know, proof. I told another one of our friends, here's what I did. They're like, you're kidding. Why would you do that? No, they're not going to. And I said, yeah, watch. They came back. They were all ashen white, man. <laughs> you know, um, poor thing, you know, just like they just ashen white, like, oh, my God, I now have evidence that everything is happening and I'm not the lucky one and I'm not the one that's involved. I'm not the one that gets to be this and that, hey, whatever, you know, jealousies and all that kind of thing. And um, that was kind of the end of the relationship. And you may or may not agree with the methodology. All I know is I'm saying, for me, it's like, Judas, let's just get it over with. And it's kind of a bummer. I remember um, I remember a gentleman um because males a lot of times get competitive with other males. And so, um, you know, there were some males that were kind of competitive, especially if their wives or girlfriends come to workshops. They, want, they don't like them going, you know, to listen to another guy teach. So one guy was really losing it, man. He was getting jealous and ticked off and irritable. And he blew up or something. I can't remember the details, but he blew up. Um, and everybody kind of saw what it was about. So he caught himself to his credit. He caught himself. And he came to me and he sat with me and he said, you know, I just want to apologize. I, I think I was just caught in jealousy. And it was really beautiful that he caught himself. And he said, and, and I want to apologize and I'd like your forgiveness. And I said, absolutely. Thank you for catching it. Thank you for apologizing. I get it. But I did say to him, however, I need you to know that once you've been bitten by this or the ego attack, you know, your, you've increased exponentially your odds of another bout of this. So I said, even though right now you're recovering, each time you recover from this kind of ego virus, it gets you, it recurs more frequently or more likely recurs. So I said, you're going to have to really watch yourself because the odds are already large. Let's pretend it's, you know, 80% that they're going to go there again. Once you've allowed your ego to plant itself, it's, you know, like weeds. You just throw some weed seeds down where they weren't. And now you're going to be fighting something almost every year guaranteed um, because they're, they're just now going to take off. So it's like that. Once the weeds get in the mind, man, it's hard to get them out. And they can only be taken out with when we decide I want to heal more than I want this, you know, to, to, to deny this. I'd rather have some healing than just playing this game. So it takes tenacity, but, but let's look at it this way. Treat self-sabotage like any other addiction and you will increase 
exponentially and tremendously, you will increase your ability to then deal with it, to eliminate it or resolve it or lessen it. Treat it like an addiction where you have to call on God's help, where you have to look at your own agendas, um, your own lack of tenacity around these kinds of things, self-serving and all that, and what you can do about it because it's going to happen. You know, um, it happens to me and in, in, in you think, you know, maybe people are always nice and loving and whatever. Uh, no, instead, you know, you, you get to be a target when you're in this role and um, a target of all kinds of things. People I've never even met um, still form opinions. Um, they're not going to come out of that anytime soon. You know, and I've had people say to me, listen, Michael, um, you know, a friend of mine, they, they didn't meet you, but they didn't, they disliked you because they, they heard you speak about this or that you don't speak about that. So they had all these already opinions of you, um, but I've talked them down. So it, can they come to your workshop? I'm like, they don't realize, man, it, they're well-intended. I talked them down. I, I made my mother-in-law like you, you know, because she's a certain religion and she didn't like your, your, your beliefs, but they want to now, they're open to coming to a, a workshop. It's not a good idea, I tell them. Don't talk people into liking me. And I'm saying the same to you. When you or your friends have to talk other people into liking you, it means that they just simply got a little bit of the shovel in the dirt a little, but it's still hard dirt. And it's going to be hard work to convince them otherwise. I'm not saying it's always worthless or fruitless because if you can, and I have, turn people around to where they, they go, you know, I'm really... Um, grateful that my judgments were wrong. I mean, it's so beautiful. It may be the best compliment I could ever receive is that somebody was that was flipping out catches themselves and bounces back. Not because it's me, but because they've done that. Whether they've done it with God or Jesus or me or their best friends or their partners, it's always a good thing when someone bounces back. But the context of today is self-sabotage. And I'm saying in the context of self-sabotage, it's a very rare thing that people will bounce back. It's just, there's such a penchant for, you know, staying in this, in this dark place because it's, it makes us feel validated. If we have a little slip and a judgment and then some evidence enters and drops on the table before us, we love to go, Whew. so I wasn't being judgmental. I was just correct that this person was messed up or bad. See, it's just all it does is we're looking for validation, but validation of what, you know, validation of ego uh, opinions or judgments? Why would we even want validation of that? It, we're already wrong if we're in our ego judgments. So just something to consider, all right? Um, so remember there's the, you know, conscious and unconsciousness of self-sabotage. There's reasons why we sabotage ourselves. We're control freaks or we're, you know, we're wanting to be um, in denial or we're so angry and hurt about something. We, we got to take it out on somebody and we find somebody and just start throwing darts at them. Um, so there's all that makeup and then dealing with it. Like I said, look at some of the techniques I shared about that. Um, acceptable flaws so that you're not, you, you know, you're sort of preventing yourself from throwing it all out and saying, wait a minute. I can breathe. I can actually let that person rest with under the category of acceptable issues. You know, it may sound strange, but it works. It's beautiful too, because it allows a little more room. And then, like I said, if you see suspect self-sabotage from people, like people that are sabotaging themselves around you, sabotaging their relationship with you, sometimes guys, I just advise, just help it out. You know, first try to bring peace, love, communication. But when they don't want the peace, love, communication, um, sometimes it's a better to just go, look, this is kind of the way it looks and let it go. Um, you might or might not feel confident enough to push it a little over the edge. Um, I think it takes a certain kind of a person to be able to do that because you have to be able to take responsibility if you push them too hard or if you push them... Um, you know, and then the thoughts of, gosh, maybe they weren't really having a hard time and I added this into their head or, um, you know, maybe I'm too cold about this because it can look cold when Jesus says, Judas, go and do what you're going to do. Why didn't he talk him out of it, guys? This is Jesus. He's a good talker. He could have said, Judas, don't you love me? Love is the meaning of life. Just touch my hand and you'll feel a vibration and a frequency of love. Judas, look at the healing we're doing. And he might have been able to wear him down, his ego down, and make him acknowledge love, you know, the love. 
But Judas, he knew, was already set on doing what he wanted to do. And I'm only saying that that little push is only to be applied when you know somebody is going there anyway. It sounds so strange for me to even tell you that, but it's something I know happens. I'm not saying you should all be soldiers of this and go out and start tossing everybody over the cliff at all. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying just be aware to know the difference between the things you can change and the things that, you know, have the wisdom to know the things you can change and not change. The wisdom to know the difference because you're harming yourself and sabotaging yourself when you enable the friends that are already sabotaging themselves. All right. So I pray that this has made sense. I pray that this could be applied in your lives as, as easily or as well as it has in mine. Um, Hope you understand the examples I shared in my own life, my own stories, because they're, they're a little strange. Um, and looking back, I mean, if I had old friends watching this, maybe even from high school, um, there's times I probably did it because I could see something was happening. So I just, I just put a little test to it, a little test to see if, you know, um, you know, a, a friend, let's say, tells me there's another friend and they're really bad talking you. Um, or whatever, as an example, you, you know, you kind of put it to the test to see if that's really what they're doing. I remember a gentleman that was accused of uh, stealing in a business. And um, so there was one person in, in sort of trying to play these two sides saying that that person's stealing money when it was in fact them. So what they did was they came up with an, a plot and they said, we're going to have the person, the person that's being accused, we're going to have them take a case of money from point A to point B, and we're going to actually uh, watch them to see if they take anything. And so this person takes it to this group where the person who was gossiping took, received the money, and then the money disappeared. Somebody had already double counted it, and they had surveillance, so they know person A that was being accused didn't do it. But the person that was accusing was the one that was actually doing it. So what they did is they just they just put it to the test to see, you know, uh, is it really this person? Is this really happening? And they found out here's what's really happening. So um, it's kind of like saying we now can make informed decisions, guys. I mean, you know, it's nice to just be clear. Judas, whatever you're going to do, just do it. Let's be clear about this. Look about how look at how he handles um, Peter. You know, Peter, you're going to deny me. Oh, no, I would never do that. Guys, look what he does. He doesn't say, oh, thank God. Whew. I thought for a moment there you might. He's like, dude, you're going to do it. I would never. I've had friends say that. You know, I. hey, man, we're like this. I would never. Gal friends, guy friends, we're, you know, we're, we're tight, man. We're, I could never. Um, and I think that maybe they did their best to hang in there as long as they could. But the temptation is just too strong. And so when the temptation comes and I see it, but they're not doing it, they're not, they're not owning it. Yeah, sometimes I have, um, I have helped it along a little bit. I'll do something that, that I'll know that they'll know and um, let them question it and see if they'll come to me. Because if they would, it'd be kind of cool. Like I did that one gal, um, you know, she eventually outed it. And like, well, I just happened, happened to notice some things in, in your room. I wasn't looking. Oh, no, not you. I just happened to find them. And I said, don't worry about it. I already told other people this was going to happen. See, if I wouldn't have told others, it would have looked like I got caught. And it was her word against mine. It was kind of cool because I'd already told other people. So it was kind of, you know, it was staged and it's a bummer. But the friendships changed at that point. Again, that was back in my, I think, late 20s, early 30s. Um, I just like and prefer that we have a consciousness and awareness of things as best we can. And um, again, it'll clean up your relationships with others who might be sabotaging their lives. Just do it, guys. If you're a therapist, if you're a friend, whatever you are, just, you know, whatever you are, just call things. Just try, kind of be a little, a little edgy and, you know, challenge things. Hey, you know, I'm just feeling like this is where this is going. Is this right? Oh, no, 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 never. You know, are you back to gambling? Are you back to drinking? Are you, oh, no, 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 never. Um, you know, instead you might say, I, I found something, you know, um, whatever the addiction might be related to. Somebody said they saw you if you knew that they were going to the track, you know. Somebody said they saw you at the track just in the last several weeks. 
and they're pretty sure it was you. Now, you can't do this if you're not pretty clear about it, but imagine what happens because what you're doing is you're putting it to the test and they say, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, I did. That's just another kind of an example. I certainly am not telling you to walk around paranoid and doing surveillance on people. I'm not into that at all. I'm just saying use examples and using examples of calling something when it seems like that's the situation. Um, especially when it comes in the context, again, I'm closing here, self-sabotage. When you think you're self-sabotaging, ask yourself some really brilliant, honest questions. Is this just an acceptable percentage? Am I just afraid of the unknown? Ask yourself some good questions and you might be able to uh, maneuver out of it. The, the tail, you know, tailspin um, or nosedive. But when other friends are doing it, are you going to be courageous enough to be able to say, hey, look, it kind of seems like you're going this direction. Am I right? You know, like to your partner, we haven't been intimate in months or years and it looks like, it, it, don't you think? And they might say, oh, no, no, no. There you go. So somebody's not clear yet. And you might say, well, why don't we consider calling it live-ins instead of partners? You know, do something to move the energy, change what you can and accept what you can't. And again, have the wisdom to know the difference. So I pray this has made good sense and thank you so much for your patience and your time and joining us.